folks, Dean Somerset here. I uh, put up a status on Facebook a little while ago that I was going to do a video Q&A, so I had a whole bunch of people comment and question anything that they wanted to ask a question on that would take more than like a one or two sentence word answer that I normally do in a Facebook status Q&A. So I wanted to be able to answer some of the questions that came up and some of the most popular ones. Uh, first one is from Danavir Saria. He says, I get a lot of pain near my hip flexor on my left leg when I squat. It doesn't always happen. Actually, most of the time, if I position myself right, I will only feel a slight pain, but when it hurts, I literally cannot squat. Even when it only hurts slightly, it still sucks. This only happens with bilateral squatting. So I'm guessing that since you were describing everything in there, that there should be a question, but there's no actual question. The question will probably be, uh, what do I do about that? Um, this is common with a lot of people that they have hip flexor pain or any kind of anterior hip tightness going on. Uh, a lot of the time, there's a whole bunch of things going on in that area. It's called the zone of apposition. You have the psoas, you have the iliacus, the common tendon, the iliopsoas, the rectus femoris, uh, pectineus, pretty much anything on the front of the hip gets all bunged up in that one area. Without getting too specific, because I don't know you, don't know how you squat, don't know how you move, don't know what's going on with your tissue, I would say that most likely there's some sort of a positional issue going on. Uh, if anything, maybe you're standing a little bit too close together and your toes are pointing too close. Maybe open your stance up and go a bit more externally rotated and then make sure your knees drive a little bit more in line with your toes rather than letting them collapse in. A lot of the time the hip flexor tendon and a lot of that stuff under the zone of that position can just get bunged up if the hip is too tight or if your femur is coming too tight into the ridge of the pelvis. So just by opening your stance up a lot of the time the pain goes away. That might not be the best answer you were looking for but Everybody's a little bit different with that. I might even say that uh, you might need to think about embracing your core a little bit differently. Maybe you're in a bit too much of thoracic extension and you're not quite getting the anterior core to hold properly. Uh, maybe your breathing patterns are a little bit off with it and that's kind of causing the psoas and the iliacus to kind of kick up a little bit more tension. But maybe just work on repositioning your feet and getting them moving around a little bit differently. Uh, what's next? Ah. Cameron James asked a question, not sure if this has been asked before, but could you give your take on Kelly Starrett's feet forward and knees out cue? I recently read this post and he links to a post on DS strength, which is supple leopard versus the world, my take on the knees out debate. Um, it's a really interesting concept that Kelly brings up. Essentially, with a lot of heavy, heavy weightlifters with Olympic lifting, you normally see them line up with their toes and then their knees and then their hips. So they almost form like a, an oblique triangle going on. Um, I'm not too keen on doing that type of a squat just because I think it's kind of the pendulum swinging the opposite direction of a valgus stress into a varus stress. So if you have hips, knees, feet, where the knees kind of come together, that's a valgus stress and that puts a lot of tension on the knee and kind of causes wearing patterns and a little bit of an odd angle. If you go hips, knees, feet, that's a varus stress. And if we think about a lot of things about muscle balance, how the body works and everything, it kind of works on a pendulum aspect. You can go to a certain degree to one way, you can go to a certain degree the other way before problems start happening or before pain starts happening. So a, a lot of people do kind of like a reciprocal action for whatever causes an injury. So if valgus stress is bad, let's go everything varus stress. I don't know if that's necessarily the way that Ke Kelly is taking this about or what the biomechanics that he's looking at are, but whenever you go too far to one end or another, you start to run into problems. And I can see how this could be something that people could do too much of or start working a little bit too hard on and really start damaging the knee joint. Essentially the knee is designed to have a mild valgus angle to it. So if you're pushing the knee into a varus angle, you're essentially going to be taking the knee from this position and pushing it to here. So the only contact area that you're getting is just on the medial meniscus and it's going to eventually wear down and cause some pain and trauma. It also stretches out the LCL to a certain degree and causes some tibial rotation to be able to get you in that position. That doesn't mean it's necessarily bad, but it might not be something that I would necessarily cue somebody on. If somebody's really having trouble getting into their squat pattern, I might adjust what their foot is doing. I might look at doing more of like a Yanda short foot posture. So instead of a flat foot like this, getting them to actually form a bit of an arch. And I did a blog post, or not a blog post, a video a little while ago on tibialis posterior and changing the foot structure. So I'll um, link into that one if you can. But uh, as far as cueing everybody to have their knees out, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the best option for a lot of people. Uh, Kelly's a smart guy, he's a doctor of physical therapy from what I understand, so from the biomechanics and injury perspective, I get that he knows what he's talking about, but at the same time, I don't think that it's going to be really fair to whitewash everybody and saying you always have to do this, or this cures all injuries, or we've never had a problem with an athlete doing this. First to say you've never had an athlete have a problem doing that is kind of a logical fallacy. It's like saying, well, because I have this rock and there's no tigers around, this rock therefore 
prevents tigers from coming on. It's kind of a jump, but at the same time, if you say, we've never had a problem, well, what happens if there's just waiting to be a threshold? If they're waiting to have that six month threshold where at that certain point in time, everybody's needs start exploding. And if you haven't hit that threshold yet, of course you're not gonna have any kind of problems. Uh, not to say that their athletes are gonna have problems, but at the same time, it's not something that I would jump into queuing. Also, if you look at a lot of really high class Olympic weightlifters, when they start their pull, their knees are out. But as they get into the catch of their front squat, their knees dive into a valgus stress. And that's not to say that anything bad about their technique or that that's unnatural or that it is natural, but to put everybody in saying you have to be here, I'm never really a fan of. If somebody has trouble with their hip mobility, trouble with their knee mobility, trouble with their ankle mobility, if that's a better position for them, great, we'll use it. But if it's not a good position, I'm not going to try to force it. It's like trying to put a round peg into a square hole. It may not be the best bet for everybody, but it might be something that some people really get a lot out of. Uh, Khalid El Masari, where do you come up with topics for your articles and blogs? Also, what does creating pistols with your hands do as far as the hip hinge? Double question Khalid's got rocking on this one. I would love to sit here and say that I have a process when it comes to writing. I don't have a process. Essentially, I'll think of something because I'm training a client and they show something that's different or cool or unique or whatever, and I'll be like, oh, I should write a blog post on that one. Okay, I'll go write a blog post on that. Or I'll see something floating around on the internet that I think I should put a topic on and say, okay, I'll write a blog post on that. Most of the time, I write blog posts the night before they get published, and I don't really put a lot of time into them just because i got a lot of other things that I have going to go. But at the same time, I want to make sure that blogging is kind of an important feature that I put together. So with a lot of the blog posts and how I come up with topics, it's... I guess you could say as organic as possible. It's I get inspired by something and I think, oh, that would make a cool topic and I do something on that. Um, yeah, I wish I could give you more information on that, but really I'm kind of a loser when it comes to writing. I just write what I see and know and I guess that's what everyone tells you to do. But I don't really plan things out as far as how to write or what to do or what topics to pick. Usually it's stuff that I think is cool, which is kind of why I write about it. I don't want to write about stuff that I don't think is cool or lame or anything like that. but. If it's something that really piques my interest, I put it out there. If it's something that I don't really care about, I'd imagine not too many other people would care about, but again, I'm a weird, goofy Canadian, so I mean, I probably think of some weird things that most people wouldn't think of. What does creating pistols with your hands do with the hip hinge? So this is something that uh, I touched on a while ago and I usually teach in a lot of my workshops. If you take your thumb and your forefinger and kind of make pistols and put that underneath your chin, all it does is line your neck up into a better position so people don't start going forward, back, looking up, or doing all sorts of funky stuff with their neck when they do a hip hinge exercise. So if you keep the pistols here, as they go through that hip hinge and as they come back up, their neck stays neutral. That way they focus on getting the hips to do the work rather than having their neck keep a horizontal trajectory or a parallel line or anything like that with horizon. And essentially it just takes away that neck out of the equation. It just means that all they can really focus on is their hips. If they just keep contact here, they can't push their head forward, they can't pull back, they can't look up or down, or they'll lose that position. So. Uh, index fingers under the chin, thumbs on their sternum, and away they go. That just locks everything and makes it a lot easier to coach and cue for people. Uh, another one from Luke Worthington. Do you consider inflammation to be an essential part of the remodeling process or something to be avoided and controlled? Really good question on this one. Uh, inflammation is necessary for your body. That's why it's there. If it wasn't necessary, it wouldn't be there. The inflammatory process causes the influx of new blood vessels, new blood proteins, uh, removal of waste, fluid into the areas, which speeds healing. The downside is that when you have chronic inflammation or you have an athlete that can't quite recover on their own because they're training, competing, training, competing, and they get stuck in a vicious cycle where they're not able to allow the inflammatory phase to run its course. So a lot of pro athletes, a lot of amateur athletes, if they have a really intense training calendar, they can't take advantage of that inflammatory cascade on its own because they literally just don't have the time. So in that phase, if inflammation is present, it can actually downregulate a lot of nerve and muscle activity and make it a little bit harder for the body to actually perform and be fired up. And a lot of the time you'll see this if you have a hard workout, the next morning you wake up, you're sore, you're creaky, you're groaning, all that kind of stuff. That's a model of inflammation. So DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, is actually an inflammatory biomarker of saying that there's something that's been damaged or stressed. It doesn't mean it's bad, it just means that something happened and your body got a little bit beat up from it, which is normal from a hard training session. The downside is if you want to be able to have that hard training session, have the DOMS aspect and then go out and compete at a high level the very next day, probably wouldn't be the greatest thing in the world. So controlling inflammation and something like that is going to be definitely necessary and important. For the average Joe or Jane trying to recover from, let's say, an injury, 
controlling inflammation is important. However, their training calendar usually is a little bit more open and they can devote a little bit more time to the recovery aspect of a workout. If I have somebody who only trains with me maybe twice a week and I get them doing one or two days of homework, I'm not too concerned about controlling inflammation unless something that we do causes swelling. So if I have a client who's recovering from, let's say, a meniscal injury, and the next day they come in for a workout and their knee is swollen up or it's got visible perfusion into the joint or something like that, then we'll want to back off and then we'll want to work on some anti-inflammatory modalities or some anti-swelling modalities. But a lot of the time, I'm not too concerned about controlling that aspect of inflammation. Another thing you can look at for inflammatory aspects is nutritional inflammation. So some people have triggers to things like gluten, dairy, nuts, eggs, all that kind of stuff. So being aware of what type of foods they may have triggers for can play a huge role. Also in females and around their menstrual cycle, they can go through really big inflammatory aspects just based on the fact that everything is under a large amount of pressure and a large amount of tension and trauma. So being able to understand that, yeah, if somebody is in the middle of their menstrual cycle, they may not be best at doing box jumps or heavy squats or heavy deadlifts or something along that line due to the fact that they might have ligamental stretch or increased intra-abdominal pressure just due to the fact that everything's flared right up. So just altering the training program effectively and accordingly might have to be a little bit different on that aspect. Uh, Fotis, Chaz Nicolau, I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. Fotis and I have chatted a bunch of times, uh, done Skype calls and stuff like that. He's a really good guy, he's a really smart trainer, he's starting to make a big name for himself. Ways for personal trainers to sell themselves real time or on the interweb. Interwebs are awesome. Um, I honestly don't think I'm the best person to talk about sales, just due to the fact that I never try to sell. And at the end of the day, I think that's probably one of my strong suits, is that I try to let the training aspect of things, the knowledge aspect of things speak for themselves. Uh, if anyone saw my website up until like two months ago, I designed all that myself over the span of like a couple of hours at home and did all the graphic work, did all the whatever, and it's obvious because it sucked. And <laughs> I'm a trainer first and foremost, and I'm not really into graphics or computers too much. And it's funny because I make probably half of my income online and I don't know much about computers. But I know training and I know how to write sentences that are coherent, so that's how I work it. Uh, ways for personal trainers to sell themselves, the easiest way is get results for your clients. Plain and simple. You get a result for a client that they want and that they can tangibly say, this is cool, they'll keep coming back to you. If you get results for people, they'll talk to other people and then those people will come in. Uh, secondary to that is start writing. Start doing something online. If you want to promote your business online, do stuff online. Like I started up a blog because one of my clients started a blog and said, hey, you should do one too. So I was like, all right, why not? I don't have anything to lose from it. And it's not like I'm going to be investing huge amounts of money into it. So from that, I just started writing on my blog. I sucked and eventually I got a little bit better with it. I started doing videos for YouTube because I thought, hey, if I put a video out there, it'll probably say more than I could write about. And then I started doing more YouTube videos and then I got a little bit in touch with some other big names like Tony General Core played a huge role in me being able to be anything online because I interviewed him, did a Q&A back and forth, he let me do a couple blog posts on his site, then he introduced me to the editor at T Nation, and then from there I just kind of snowballed things up and up and up. But Tony's been instrumental in helping me out. Uh, Eric Cressy has also been really big in that, John Romanello helped me get into Schwarzenegger.com, and uh, John Goodman gave me a couple of shots on the PTDC to open up my network into that aspect. So because I had the blog started, people could go back and say, this guy wants to write, let's see what he can write about. And they looked at my original stuff and said, okay, this guy obviously knows one or two things about training and writing, so let's give him a shot over here. And that just kind of opened up the aspect on there. From that, I was able to show people that I knew what I was talking about, more people were able to pay attention to it and actually start building up some sort of a, a network, I guess you could say, or a following. I hate that term because it makes me sound like an omnipotent god or something. I hate that concept, but at the end of the day, if you want to sell yourself, you just have to be able to Put out good stuff. At the end of the day, if you train somebody and they get results, they'll come back to you. They'll tell other people about you. If you want to be on the online, put stuff out online. If you want to write, write. If you want to do videos, do videos. If you want to do workout programs, do workout programs. Whatever it is that you want to do, do that and do it really well and people will come and find you. You're not going to be immediately overnight success if you're not putting stuff out there and you're probably still not going to be an immediate overnight success, but you want to be able to invest two, three, five, ten years into being good at what you're doing to be able to get people to actually pay attention to it. So hopefully that helps out. Uh, next up, Ori Biala. Whether weight training does stunt growth at all for kids and young teens? 
And then Sean G. Thorne referenced an article beneath that. Champions Youth Fitness. I haven't actually read that yet. And then also strongkid.com. I haven't read that one also. So those are really good references. Um, in answer to whether it stunts growth, there is no evidence that it does ever. It was a concept that came out that said, oh, well, if you overload the joints, then it's going to stunt the, or it's going to fracture the growth plates and lead to kids being prematurely short. I don't think that's the case whatsoever because if that was the case, there would be nothing but three feet tall farm boys. And at the end of the day, farm boys are the ones that are out in the field lifting bales of hay, throwing mud, uh, doing poles, doing all that kind of stuff. And usually farm boys are pretty much the same size as everyone else. On top of that, football itself is resistance training. You run into something, you hit something, you push, you generate power. And pee peewee football has been going on forever. And there's a lot of short and a lot of tall kids that play peewee football. Competitive sports, track running, soccer, everything that you can imagine from a movement-based perspective is resistance training. You're applying force to the ground through your body, your muscles are having to generate tension. Back when I was growing up, there was something called the President's Fitness Challenge. And this was way back in the 80s. I know way back is kind of a weird concept, but that was back before the internet. Um, we used to do the President's Fitness Challenge. That would be like flexed arm hang, how many push-ups you could do, running around the gym, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Those were resistance training exercises. Now, I know a lot of people say, oh, you have to do max weight back squats. No, you gotta teach kids how to move first. And that's one of the benefits of resistance training. It teaches them how to move to start. And then you're able to load weight on it as they start getting better at it. Does it stun growth? I don't think it ever would, just due to the fact that when kids are pre-pubertal, uh, they don't have the hormonal concentration going through their body that would cause growth to be stunted yet. And until they hit puberty, unless you're doing cycles of crank or something like that while the kid's weightlifting pre-puberty, they're not gonna have any kind of hormonal aspect altered before they go in through that. But most kids usually find the gym 14, 15, 16, and I don't know, they, they probably don't seem to get their growth stunted due to the fact that they're weightlifting. If anything, they might have issues as far as, you know, getting too sexy. But at the same time, that's just my initial thoughts on that one. But I don't think that there's any evidence that actually shows uh, stunting a growth based on weight training. I think it's kind of a fallacy that a lot of parents have because there's a small risk avoid avoidance issue going on with that. If you think about weightlifting, it's so incredibly controlled and incredibly tempoed and incredibly taught hands-on that the risk is very minimal with kids as long as you're not being a complete jack bag and loading the bar up and getting kids doing tire flips and like beasting them right into the ground. Um, I think there's more risk with contact sports than there ever would be with gym. And that's just due to the compact and or contact and uh, unstable uh, variable nature of contact sports. So if your kid's out there playing hockey, he should probably should know how to do something like a hip hinge, a squat, a lunge before he starts striding. Uh, kids should probably also know how to push effectively, develop core strength if they're playing football. They should know how to run, cut, pivot, lunge, squat, deadlift, do all that kind of stuff if they're playing soccer. So I think that weight training just breaks down common sports themes that a lot of peewee football, peewee hockey uh, concepts would have and makes them more trainable on a smaller scale and also more controlled. Uh, hope you guys are having fun with this. I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying it too, but at the same time, it's kind of tough to answer some of these questions because they're really deep and in-depth questions. Josh Landis just went off hard. Like, he asked like seven questions here. Uh, what different strategies do you use to increase mobility based on different causes, and how do you truly tell the difference between mobility restriction causes? First, unless I have an ultrasound, uh, MRI, or x-ray, I can't tell whether it's bony or soft tissue or what type of soft tissue, so I guess at the best of times. Uh, what different strategies do you use? I got a couple of really good manual therapists, chiropractors, physiotherapists, massage therapists, and if there's anything that's outside of the ability for me to move a body around, I send them out to them. They're way better at that kind of stuff than I ever would be, so I use them and lean on them as much as possible. But in training, we'll use things like breathing drills, we use static stretching when it's necessary. I don't believe it's really important for everybody, but it's a modality to use. Uh, Elastic-based traction, rocking, active mobilization, joint mobilization, pretty much anything that we can do as far as gaining mobility. So again, it just comes down to using the right tool for the right job. Uh, what are some guidelines to follow to make sure progressions are appropriate for cl uh, clients? There are no guidelines. When the client is ready, they'll be ready and then you can move on. Sometimes you move a bit too fast and then you step it back. I usually don't like following guidelines because if you follow a guideline, then what works for the 65-year-old uh, double knee replacement client may not work well for the Division One football player. 
So I mean, if you use the same guideline for the body part, you just completely take out the question of training experience, age, uh, deterioration to all the concepts. So that just kind of throws things out the window. Uh, as we all know, sometimes it can be hard to know when a client is ready to progress to a movement. Trying to strike a balance between intensity of results and correct form can be tough. True. And I always try to get about a 90-10 aspect going with teaching correct form, drilling technique, and then pushing intensity. If somebody has a history of injuries to a certain area, we'll spend 90% of the time working on making sure they feel comfortable with it and progressing in a very slow, steady, linear manner. And then 10% of the time just seeing what they can do. Uh, I don't want to spend all the time babying them if they're ready to jump to the next level. But if we spend a couple of minutes doing technique drills, increase the weight they're still able to tolerate it, increase the weight they're still able to tolerate it, increase the weight they're still able to tolerate it, cool. They're able to tolerate it. When the technique starts to break down, we back it off. Last one from Josh. Also, in-depth explanation of how and when to implement breathing and deep core function into training would be cool. In-depth? Wow. Uh, honestly, I don't think that's one I'm going to be able to answer just due to the fact that that's pretty much like a year-long course and one video Q&A probably wouldn't be able to do it justice. Not to say that I don't want to, but at the same time, I think it's just such a, a deep, detailed question that it may not be something that I'm able to really touch on too much. Uh, it seems like the deep front line is a major contributor to core dysfunction. Learning how to result, reset the core is something I would like to get better with. It is, but it also comes down to a lot of other factors in there too. So you can have a muscle shut off that doesn't necessarily respond to anything else on the deep core line or anything like that. Uh, I had a consult with a girl yesterday who was in a motor vehicle accident. She's a yoga instructor who was an ex-gymnast, incredibly flexible, had lower back pain after her mo uh, motor vehicle accident, and she didn't have the ability to have her diaphragm depressing come up. Now for a yoga instructor, that's really strange, the fact that they do so much diaphragmatic breathing. But I think that she was kind of holding on to protective tension from her car accident. And that could be something fascially related. I don't think it was. I think it was just more the fact that that muscle kind of got into like a guarded state after the accident and it just never really let go. And after about 10 minutes of working with her to get diaphragmatic breathing, her diaphragm finally started to actually depress and come back up. The way I was able to tell that was just palpated under her ribs and when she would breathe in, if she actually used her diaphragm, it would push my fingers out. And what before she was just using all upper ribs and doing more apical breathing. So for her, it would depend on how she was breathing and how she was able to generate tension. The cool thing about the body is it's always going to find a way. And breathing is necessary no matter what you do. If you don't breathe with your diaphragm, you'll breathe with your ribs. If you don't breathe with your ribs, you'll breathe with your neck. If you don't breathe with that, you'll breathe with your obliques to kind of pull the diaphragm down. And you'll find a way to breathe because if you don't, you're dead. But at the end of the day, your body's great at figuring out alternative methods. But what that means is that if you don't use the originally designed equipment the way it's supposed to be used, you run into problems. So for her, because her diaphragm wasn't coming up or down, she was doing everything she could with her obliques and with her quadrangular lumborum muscles. So I think that if we start working on hammering her diaphragmatic breathing and getting that to actually respond, she won't have to use her obliques or her QLs to do all the work. The tension will release on its own over time because it doesn't have to be turned on, and she'll be able to get back into shape pretty quickly. But it's one of those things that with breathing, it's tough to be able to get really in deep with it without getting hands-on with it. I mean, I could spend, like I said, a year going through a course all on breathing mechanics. I mean, Postural Restoration Institute, DNS, they spend so much time on breathing. I don't think I could do it justice just with a video blog post or anything like that, but breathing is really important. Uh, but like I said, your body's always gonna find a way to breathe. It's just how it breathes, and then recognizing what, what it means when you actually breathe that way. So if you breathe through your neck and your shoulders, You'll see a lot of people shrug up and do this kind of stuff, and you'll probably see elevated cl uh, clavicular lines. If they breathe only through their ribs, they'll probably hinge out like that, but at the same time, those are just probably. It doesn't mean that they actually will do it all the time. It just means that that's usually the driving force. A lot of the time, you don't even need to worry about breathing. I mean, it's something that's really trendy and cool right now, but it's usually one of the things I look for in a sequence when I go through an assessment, but it's not the only thing I look for in a sequence. It's not like, oh, your diaphragm doesn't move, therefore everything else is messed up. I didn't tell you about the fact that I checked her hip range of motion. I didn't tell you I checked her strength. I didn't tell you about finding trigger points. I didn't tell you about finding her range of motion and stance, which was excellent in all dimensions, passively or doing a toe touch, all that kind of stuff. But she couldn't squat. So anytime she had to brace, she had to brace in a different manner than what would be considered optimal or ideal to get the job done. So my thought was, okay, well, maybe you have a breathing impairment going on. 
hit around the table and all of a sudden, yeah, could palpate underneath and their diaphragm wouldn't depress. So that's a thought that I have. We'll see if it pans out. That's really the true test is does it work? If it works, cool. If it doesn't work, then there's no point chasing that rabbit down the hole. Uh, and that's pretty much all the questions I had on that one. So, yeah, hopefully that helped out with a lot of people. And if it did, great. Uh, drop a comment below, like the status or like the video if you like, and share with people if you want. But uh, hopefully that helped out. And uh, I'll do this again in the future if there's a really good result out of it because it's pretty easy to do. It doesn't take a lot of time for me to do the video up. But yeah, if you guys liked it, cool. If you didn't, cool. I mean, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make you guys have a better day. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you enjoyed the beard for November. But it's getting itchy as hell, and I can't wait to shave it off come December 1. But who knows? If the wife likes it long enough, maybe it'll stay. All right. Have yourselves a good day. Enjoy.